Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Dr. Short from the National School of Theology. We're glad to be with you all today. We want to um, today get into some topics that are still looming within the house of God, around the people of God, that's hindering fellowship, um, that's causing um, a lack of unity in the faith. And we're hoping that today that we can bring some enlightenment on these scriptures. Today, we're going to be talking about baptism. There are some that still believe that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. There are others that differ in their opinion. There are still debate about whether women should preach. Um, we're going to uh, indulge in that. I think we're going to come from a different perspective uh, that's going to bring understanding to the total body of Christ. Uh, we're going to indulge into the teachings of Peter versus Paul versus John versus Jesus. We're going to indulge into that because there are many that uh, still uh, feel like, well, I'm a follower of this one, I'm a follower of that one, and uh, they don't, you know, um, he to this one or that one this was a problem in the corinthian church and we're going to deal with it again today and there are other topics that i'll probably be dealing with i want to say that um i probably won't be getting it all in today but um within the coming weeks i'm hoping to finish these topics up so be patient with me i'm trying to learn how to talk slow and take my time in teaching but we've already prayed and Let's go into God's word. In the book of, of Acts, the second chapter, is where I want to start, actually. And here is where a lot of confusion starts off, where Peter is actually talking, and he's talking about repenting. And um, I want to actually read um, in verse... 38, this is what Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is pretty much the backbone of what most Baptists are those that believe that um, you have to be baptized and i'm not trying to say that every baptist believes this but this is one of the original um denominations that had pushed this at one time and there are still some people that push that um in order for a person to be saved they have to be baptized and so let's indulge into a little historical um text about baptism Baptism actually started among the Jews. It was part of their ceremonial rituals. And so when the church came along, the church picked up the practice. Uh, and we know that uh, the church pretty much dealing with, during this time, uh, much of the church had just started to accept the Gentiles into the faith. And so when we look at the Gentiles, uh, they pretty much were still being ostracized by the Jews. And the Jews are trying to more so just dictate how the church should run. You heathens don't know, uh, and, and we're going to show you a better way. So, But when it comes to this scripture, the key word that you want to look at here is for because just like the english word you'll find that here is a word e-i-s in greek that we need to understand because in the greek the four just like in the english language could stand for many different things it could stand for because of in regarding to and in order to get these are the meanings for the word for, okay? Not that in order for you to be baptized, be saved, you have to be baptized. 
So therefore, let's use, make sure that we're using um, clear grammatical evidence that when we look at the word for, Peter was not saying that you have to be baptized in order to get saved, but because of your salvation, you should get baptized. But because of and regarding to your salvation, uh, get baptized. But that's not where the power of our evidence comes from. The power of our evidence comes in the fact that we can look at other multiple scriptures where Peter himself talked about uh, baptism, uh, excuse me, talked about salvation, and he never went into, again, uh, about the baptism. In other words, I'm saying that Peter talked about salvation, but he never talked about baptism. Look at in Acts 3 and 17 to 26. When you look there, here, Peter talks about salvation, but he never referenced again uh, about uh, being baptized. Let, uh, let me pull it up. Um, it says, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God uh, foretold by the mouth of the prophets that this Christ, uh, this Christ, again, would suffer, he thus fulfilled and repented, therefore, um, repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. This is what he's telling them. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. He does not tell them, re repent and be baptized. He just says, repent that the time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord that ye may uh, send the Christ appointed for you. Again, he doesn't mention the word repent nowhere in there. Verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. Moses said, and the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like unto me. So, so therefore, in all of this, we do not see again uh, Peter talking about being baptism. So see, what we have to look at is that we have to look at the fact that scripture is the best interpretation of scripture. If we're going to understand God's word, you have to understand one of major hermeneutical principles. Hermeneutics is the art and science of interpreting scripture. One of the principles of interpreting scripture is knowing that scripture interpretates scripture. Well, this is what we're doing. This is the principle that we're using to interpret Acts. So we find one scripture thus far that Peter never mentioned baptism. Look in Acts 4. Here's a second one in Acts 4, 8 through 12. It says, and Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, Rulers of, rulers of the people and elders, have you been examined today concerning a good deed uh, done to a triple man? Because you remember Jesus had, uh, excuse me, not Jesus, but uh, Peter had prayed for the man that was laying at the gate. Um, and I want to kind of skip just a little bit. Verse 11, uh, he goes on. Um, well, I'm, let me go back to verse that we don't want to skip. Let it be known unto all of you that in all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by whom this man is, is standing before you, this Jesus is the stone, which was rejected by the builders and made the cornerstone. Said Then he goes on, verse 12, and their salvation is in no else, no one else, for there is no other name uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. He doesn't mention, when he talks about salvation, he doesn't mention baptism. So let's go back to Acts 2. So therefore, that this is how Peter was teaching. He did not mean, when you look at the word for, he does not, definitely does not mean what we formerly thought that mean. It I mean because of your salvation, you should get baptized. Why get baptized? Because baptism is an outward showing of an inward work. That's all. It's just a testimony of what God has done on the inside. You're allowing people to know that as I went under the water, uh, I went in uh, again. It's just a, uh, a symbolism of getting that going down, that we go down and old man come up a new man. That's what that is. So that is there. But let me put a nail in the coffin. Let's go to Corinthians. 
again in Corinthians one. I want to put a nail into this coffin. This is gonna, this is gonna do it. I know you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. But I, I think that some of you uh, that still have a problem, again, I think this will uh, put the nail on the coffin. Look in first, uh, first Corinthians, where Paul is talking, and I want, uh, and they're debating about baptism, they're debating about who's under who. Look at verse twelve. Uh, I'm going to start from verse eleven. It says, "My brother, some from Cleo household." have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Uh, among you. What I mean in this is that you know, some of you say, I follow Paul. Another say they follow Apollos. Another say I follow Cephas. Still another say I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified to you? Now, Paul is really being sarcastic. Was I crucified? You know. Um, were you baptized into the name of, uh, of my name? No, you weren't. I am thankful that I did not baptize any one of you guys except for Cryphus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I baptized the household of Cephas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Now, verse 17, here's the nail in the coffin. He says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with words of man wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Listen to what it said. In case some of you didn't catch it. He says, for Christ did not send me to baptize. Baptism is not, is not my anointing. Baptism is not what I call to do. Dipping folks in water is not what he called me to preach the word of God. That was his mandate was to preach the word of God. Baptism was not his mandate. There's no way to get around that. So all of you that are followers of Paul, all of you that are into the, the letters of Paul, well, here you go. Paul says, this is not what God sent me to do. Okay, so we stop right there because that's enough irrefutable evidence that baptism is not a requirement for salvation. It's an old Jewish traditional custom ceremonial that took place and it was slowly weeded out as you go on, slowly being weeded out. And Paul just said, look, that's not what God called me to do. Let, let, let's, let, let's not flirt around. I, I, there's so much preaching I got to do. Uh, will you, there's others that can go ahead and do that. If you want to, that's fine. He did not condemn it. He just said, that's not what God called me to do. So, so I'm not condemning baptism. I just want to put baptism in its proper perspective. It's not something that you have to do, but it should be something you should want to do. Again, it's a beautiful experience. It is a beautiful experience to signify uh, your relationship with God. We all should want to have have that. But even John himself said, "There has come one um, one that's more modern than I that should not that will baptize you again with Holy Ghost and with fire." That's the baptism you want. You want the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism with fire. This is the baptism that we need. Amen. Well, that is one topic that um, I hope that it helps some of you. Furthermore, I want to go into, let's discuss this about women preachers. I'm quite sure all of you have heard all the scriptures read from the book of Corinthians, even in Timothy, uh, about the women being silent in the church, a woman not being called to preach. And so I just want to bring out something. That first, Paul was not the pastor, and hear me clearly, of every church at this time. In order for this to be an ecumenical doctrine, a doctrine that uh, was for all people, uh, it was not an interdenominational inter doctrine, something that, again, would be for every church in the whole wide world. That was that, not that kind of doctrine. How do we know that? Because 
Paul specifically, specifically wrote to the church or churches that he was talking to. So we know that when he wrote to the Corinthians, that he referenced the Corinthians. And when he wrote to the Romans, even though he was in Corinth, he wrote to the Roman church. So we know who he was talking to. Well, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that when we look at the churches, that Paul was not the pastor of all these churches. How do we know that? Well, because simple, that Paul did not come along till 40 to 50 years later after the ascension of Christ. He did not come along till after, ten, at least 10 years after, the day of Pentecost. So when we look at the gospel being preached, the gospel was well on its way before Paul was converted. How do we know that? Because Paul was one of the ones that was saying against the apostles concerning the preaching of Christ. Paul admitted it. That's why the church was afraid of him. Paul was one of the persecutors. That's amazing. Paul was one of the persecutors of the church. So that says that Paul was persecuting the church. There had already been uh, churches well developed before Paul was converted. And if there were churches, that means there were people preaching. Now, now Paul had just got saved 20 some years later then who established all these church, churches? Well, we do know that he didn't establish the church of Rome because historical evidence points out that it wasn't Peter, that it was some unknown saint that did this, someone not known that done this, that started the church in Rome. So we do know that there were many people that were actually preaching the gospel um, that Paul did not know well before Paul's conversion, well before Paul got saved. We do know that even John, that was on the Isle of Patmos, his letter, James' letter, were all written before, again, Paul. So we looked that Paul did not start these churches. James was, James's letter was written before Paul's letter. So when Paul wrote his letter to the Romans and the Corinthians, the church of Corinth, then we know one fact. that He couldn't have been writing to all the churches. He couldn't have been writing to churches that he did not develop. There were churches that Peter had uh, developed. There were uh, churches that James had developed. There were churches everywhere. Again, because how do we know that? Because in Acts, the second chapter, day of Pentecost, uh, again, well, first chapter, God told them, Jesus told them where to go. Jerusalem, Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the world. So he told them to disperse, dis disperse and go out. How do we know they were dispersed? They were dispersed because of persecution, because of Paul. They got out from where their comfort zone and began to preach the gospel not because of just what God had told them to do, because of Paul chasing them all over the place. Therefore, the gospel went abroad because they were being persecuted right there in their hometown in Jerusalem because of persecutors. And so therefore, they had to go out. So what is the point? My point is that when Paul wrote about the women being silent, this was issue within the rope within the uh, excuse me the Church of Corinth. This was an issue that was taking place with their church and not church uh, uh, worldwide. Because note that no other writer brings this out, but Paul. This was an issue. The other historical fact I want to bring to you is this, that women being leaders was not an issue during that time. How do we know that? Because pretty much every major deity was female. 
Many of your deity, many of your false gods were deity. Many of your false leaders were women. Jezebel, number one. They were, again, leaders. Men during that time did not have a problem with women being leaders. Going back to the prophets, Deborah. The Bible also says that Philip had three daughters that prophesied. The three daughters that prophesied, we need to go into the book of Corinth again and look what the word prophesy means. Okay, so it tells you if he had three daughters that prophesied, he goes on and said that the person that prophesied, that he who speaks, uh, prophesied speaks into men to edify, to comfort, and exhort. Look into the 14th chapter. He that prophesied, prophesied to men to edify, to comfort, and exhort. So here, Philip had three daughters that were anointed to prophesy. That means to edify. Comfort and exhort. Exhortation is preaching. So prophesy means the preaching. So we all you know right now, those of you that believe that women aren't called to preach, all you know is that that was a problem in the Roman church. And that Paul was, I was talking to, to Timothy about it. But this problem was solely one or maybe two or three churches at the most. Paul was referring to, but he couldn't have been talking to the churches that Peter had erected. He couldn't have been talking to the ones that John had erected. He couldn't have been talking about the one that James erected. All the other churches. So if you can show me where, where Paul wrote was universal, ecumenical, that it, he was writing to different denominations, different faiths, different ones, that he, were, he was over all the other apostles. And his letter went to all of them. Show me where his letter went to all those other churches. Then we can start discussing again. I mean, we can just discuss because you still haven't won nothing. But the fact is, we can prove and have proven that there were many churches, probably at least two dozen churches, that Paul did not start and he was not writing to nor talking to. And so if God did not want women to preach, why did he not speak to James, John, and the rest of the other apostles? Why did he why did he anoint Philip's daughters to prophesy? It's black and white. Okay, this is Dr. Short. We're gonna stop right now. We're gonna let you Pray about that. Think about that. And um, I'll be back with you. And hopefully in a few days, Lord's will, uh, we're going to indulge in some other uh, topics because there are some that feel like that Paul was going around contradicting Jesus. And he was not contradicting Jesus at all. Um, I, I will say this, that Jesus preached kingdom. Nothing but kingdom all kingdom. That was Jesus' message. Paul preached justification. Paul preached repentance. Paul preached grace. None of those things, again, takes away from kingdom preaching. At the end of the day, you're getting to the same result. If you're preaching kingdom, you still got to preach the uh, uh, grace. You still have to preach justification. After you're preaching justification, preaching grace, you still got to preach kingdom. You are preaching kingdom. So let's stop the semantics and understand that they were not bickering one against another. They just had different means of getting to the same results souls being saved, souls being born again. And I know people like to have their flyers out, oh, we preaching kingdom as though they're not preaching. Not, just because you use the word kingdom don't mean you're preaching kingdom. Because if you don't know nothing about justification, if you don't know nothing about purification, sanctification, glorification, you don't know nothing about kingdom. So just because you use the word kingdom, you still need to educate yourself and learn more about justification. Why Paul uh, brought out about Abraham and Peter 
in discussing justification. And uh, so we look forward to getting back with you. God bless you. This is Dr. Short from the National School of Theology. If you'd like to learn more, if you want to start in getting involved with the National School of Theology, please give me a call, 302-465-8077. Uh, again, my email address is short at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out. God bless you. May have a smile upon you. Amen.